I want to welcome everyone here today. I'm glad to see so many out here. I see a few faces I don't uh, right off the hand recognize. So if you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here and you chose to be with us this morning to worship the one true God, the God of all creation. Yesterday we had a vacation Bible school up here. And we had a good turnout and I want to thank all the teachers and everyone who helped with food and helped in any capacity. We had a good turnout, really good lessons, we had a good group of kids. And yesterday we learned about stories from, about Moses from the book of Exodus. And so this morning I'd like to do the same and I'd like to um, bring up some of those stories that we talked about yesterday. Except I want to go a little bit further. I want to see that these stories that we learned about yesterday did not only happen in the history of God's people, but they also happened to create a pattern for Christianity today. As you can see by the illustration, we're going to have some illustrations, but let's be honest, young and old, we all like cartoons. So that's going to carry us through this this morning. And we're going to start as we look at the evil taskmaster, Pharaoh. That a Pharaoh rose up in Egypt who did not know Joseph and did not know the one true Jehovah. As he looked out, he realized that there were more Israelites and they could be a threat to him. So he made their lives very difficult and very hard. And he put tasks before them. Got them to building and got to do hard, laborious work. And that sort of reminds us of the life that we have before we come to Christ. A life that is in the world. As it says here in Romans 6 verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. A life that is apart from Christ and a life that is apart from God is one that is much like what the Israelites went through. That as they were bound by an evil taskmaster that, that had them work very hard, those who are in the world today are bound by a much worse taskmaster, and that is Satan. For he has fooled them. He has fooled the world into believing the deceitfulness of sins, and they live in heavy bondage, whether they know it or not. And we make a choice every day, whether to live under that bondage, or as we will see this morning, a progression of obedience that leads to righteousness. Now, of course, we couldn't have a vacation Bible school and, and talk about Moses without going over the plagues. And the plagues are, are cool stories of, of miracles performed, and it goes a little bit deeper as adults because we realize that these were not just random plagues. These were not just random occurrences. Rather, what they, had done, what they d did is that they showed God's power over the false gods of Egypt. And one by one, we see God's power overcoming man's wisdom, overcoming the idolatry of Egypt, one plague after another, until finally we come to the last one. And in preparation for this plague that would be the death of the firstborn, Innocent blood had to be shed. And that innocent blood of the lamb had to be put upon the doorposts and upon, upon the lintels of that door in order to prevent death from occurring in that household. So we turn to, back to Ephesians and we read in chapter 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And, and, and who is this Him? We are talking about Jesus Christ. And just as that pattern was back then, that that innocent lamb that had no spot or blemish was sacrificed, the same is true of our Savior, who had no sin, who had no faults, no transgressions at all, but gave His blood freely to prevent our death. Because of our separation that we had from God, he had to sacrifice himself, and it was his blood that was saving. And it is that blood that we will talk through this morning. And Paul, you couldn't have picked a better invitation song. That was awesome. Or, or we got it right on right there. So it's going to be a great invitation song. And we're going to talk about that blood and how important that really is. And so finally, after the plagues, the hard heart of Pharaoh relented. 
and he let the Israelites go to worship their God. And they left the area that they were in and they traveled a great distance to the borders of the Red Sea. And they were led by a cloud by day and a pillow of fire by night. But eventually, the Egyptians pursued after them. As you can see in this picture over here, whoever did this, this depiction was correct because the people murmured and they complained and they did not know why this was happening. Why did we even leave if this was going to happen, if they were going to pursue us? And do you know what Moses said? He turned to the people and he said, fear not. First, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind right on the borders of salvation, nearly to where they would be free from the bondage that they were under for so long. And they had seen the miraculous powers of God in one plague after another, overcoming the world's wisdom. And yet when they get right there nearly to the point of salvation, they wish to turn back. They wish to give up. And what did Moses say? He knew exactly what the problem was. Fear. Fear immobilizes us. And just as this pattern is, as people today, as they want to leave the bondage of sin and they want to do what's right, they want to have that obedience that leads to righteousness, but they don't. Why? Because of fear so many times. Fear of what their family will say. Fear of what the world will say. Fear of not being able to live up to a standard that, that Christ has set for us. Fear immobilizes us. And there are people today who are still standing on the Egyptian side of life, aren't they? They want to make a change, but they won't because of fear. Fear comes from one thing, and it's that evil taskmaster Satan. If he can hold on, if he can hold on to people a little bit longer, he can keep them on that Egyptian side, can he? And they never get to be obedient unto righteousness. But God did not give us fear. He gave us a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. And then we have the great... Miraculous parting of the Red Seas. The, the hands of Moses go up and the rod is lifted. And the waters abate and they, they are, allow the Israelites to walk through on dry land. And I want you to imagine what that would look like. I mean, we've seen shows about it and we've seen pictures about it and representation. But imagine what that would have been like. It says they walked on dry land. And they went down from the banks in which they were and they crossed over. And there's, there's controversy about what part of the land that they crossed over, but that's not the point of the story. The point is they went down and they were provided a passageway down besides the waters. These, these walls of water there on either side of them and as they walked across with the possessions that they had and their children and their family and what they could carry, they crossed over this Red Sea and they came out the other side and they came up out of the water. Does that sound like something that we have to do today? There are three verses I want to look at today, and the first actually links this passage with baptism. And it starts off in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So it is important to look at that and to think of that representation of the going down, of the passing through, and the coming up out of the water. Romans 6, verses 3 through 6, a rather lengthy passage, but so very important. And listen to what it says. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. For if we have been unified together with the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with. And listen to what it says here. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. These all link together, don't they? That that pattern was all the way back there. That in order to not be slaves any longer to the burdens that they were, that they were cast upon them, they had to be baptized through the Red Sea. Today it is no different. 
For us to put off that old man and to get out of that old life, we must pass through the waters of baptism today. And just as that word baptized, meaning immersion into water, fully immersed, being covered by water, the same symbolism was all the way back here that they had to completely pass through the Red Sea. Revelation 1.5. But why do we have to be baptized? I don't understand. Well, God commands it. But what's the importance of this? Revelation 1.5. Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to Him, to Jesus Christ, who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. You remember that, that doorpost? You remember that lintel covered in blood? You remember that innocent blood that had to be shed back then so that death would not come to them? The same thing is going on here. Is that we must come in contact with that blood, and if we don't, spiritual death is upon us. We cannot have our sins washed away. And it is at the point of baptism is where that blood is applied. Revelation 1.5, such an powerful ver verse showing that with baptism we come into contact with that pure, life-saving blood of Jesus Christ. And after they came out on the other side, we, hear, we read in the Scriptures, and we oftentimes don't spend much time looking, but the Song of Moses, a, a time of rejoicing. And this was a time that reminds me a lot of Acts chapter 8, doesn't it? Where we see Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, and after he was baptized and he came up out of the water, what did the eunuch do? He went on his way rejoicing. Why wasn't he rejoicing earlier? Because his sins were still on him then. And this is important to point out too here, is that when the Israelites were on the Egyptian side, and they were being pursued, did they believe in God? Absolutely, they did. They saw the miracles. They saw how great and powerful He was. Was that belief enough to get them out of the bondage of sin? No. They had to pass through, and through obedience, pass through the Red Sea. Jesus Christ says in Mark 16, 16, it's a great verse. It's short, it's powerful, it's serious. That he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Apply it to this story in Moses. He that believes and crosses over and is baptized through the Red Sea shall be saved. What if I just believe only? Well, if you didn't make it through the Red Sea, you had an Egyptian army on you, and you wouldn't have made it. So it is baptism that is the final act that takes us from a state of being lost in the world under the bondage of sin and puts us in a right state with God. And after the rejoicement, their journeys lead them Mount Sinai. What an impressive sight that must have been. A long journey, an arduous journey. And it leads them to Sinai. And Sinai is so important because it is, just like everything else we've talked about, a symbol. Now we look, of course, and we know that at Sinai was, we see the Ten Commandments given by the very finger of God upon the stone tablets. And all of these things are shadows, a foreshadowing of things to come. We read in Hebrews, it's kind of cut up a little bit, verse 18 and 22 through 23 in chapter 12, but it says this, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire. You look at that passage in a little bit more length, you see that it's talking about Mount Sinai. It's talking about the account of Moses and the Israelites. And you go on and read it, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. When you are baptized, you are not just left astray, but by the very hand of God, you are placed within the church when you are saved. Where is that found? Acts 2, verse 47. You don't come up here and you don't answer a few questions and everybody doesn't just vote on you. But it says, God added to the church those who were saved daily. And let's go back to Moses. When they crossed over that Red Sea, they say, all right, I know, we're on the other side of the Red Sea. You can go over here, and you can be a part of this group, and we'll, you'll be fine. And we're going to put you over here, and you're going to be a part of this group, and y'all can go your own way. And y'all can do it a little differently, but we're all going to be okay, because we're all God's people. They stayed together. They were one unified group. They were a called out. They were a sanctified people who crossed the Red Sea, and it is no different today. That once you have put Christ on in baptism, it is not just an open cafeteria plan wherever you wish to go. You have been added to the Lord's church. And there is only one church. Look at what it says here. 
to the church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Jesus Christ. We can see in Jesus Christ that he said in Matthew 16, 18, that I will build my church. There was not a multiplicity of them. It was going to be one. And just as this symbol back here was, it's important for us today to realize that there is only one church. And only one church has that saving blood of Christ on them. Acts 20, verse 28. But like anything, they have crossed the Red Sea. They have been saved. They have been given their commands, laws in which they are to follow. And then in human nature, they start murmuring. They start complaining. They start, they start going away from what God wants them to do, and even to the point, they make themselves an idol. A golden calf that they melted earrings down and, and possessions, and they formed this while Moses was on the mountain fellowshipping with God. The truth is, the unfortunate truth is that some are going to turn back. Some are going to cross the Red Sea and be baptized and be added to the church. But some are going to go back. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. I want you to listen to that again. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. You know, we like to think, well, well that's the rest of the world. The rest of the world, everybody who's outside of the church, he's not well pleased with them. These were people by a pattern that had crossed that Red Sea and were part of God's people. The truth is, is as we sit here in this assembly this morning, is he well pleased with all of us? With most of us? With some of us? With few? Are we striving to do the will of God? And let's read on here. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. Now, all these things happened. And this is what Bill read this morning. Now all these things happened to them as examples. that They were written for our admonition. What specifically does it say here that we should flee from idolatry and from lusts? You see, a lot of people believe that, well, I've been baptized into Christ. Now that I'm in Christ, I've got it. I've got it made. I'm saved. You have entered into a safe state, but now your journey has begun. And just like the Israelites, they wandered. And they lived in a perpetual state of wandering. They had no permanent home. This is for us to remember as well is that we don't have a permanent home here, do we? We are pilgrims. Here we are, but strained pilgrims. We don't have a permanent residence here. And the truth is, too many of us have set up residence in this life. Life is good. I've got everything that I need. They understood it back then, living in tents, constantly moving, because they knew that was not their permanent home. We need to remember that this place is temporary. Everything we see before us is going to be burned up one day, in one way or another. And that we have a place that we are working towards. And unfortunately it says that there will be few that will be there. And we read on. And we see through Exodus as well as through other books that we're coming to the close of Moses' life. And he is not going to enter in to Canaan's land. And the new leader Joshua will be appointed that will take them over there across the Jordan. So Moses does not get to go on, but despite that, he has taken up permanent residence in Hebrews chapter 11. The roll call of faith. He has listed in one of the longest sections in chapter 11 as a true hero of faith and trust in God and obedience unto righteousness. But just as he looked over and he could see there was a, there was a place prepared, we as Christians today should remember that we have a place prepared as well. John 14, 2, our Savior says this, My Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. You ever think of heaven that way? That's where we're supposed to go. That's where we're designed to go. That's where God wants us to be. And He wants us to be up there with Him. But it's through the choices that we make will dictate if we'll be there or we will be in eternal destruction. Matthew 7, verse 14, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, 
and there are few who find it. Just as we read before, as God was displeased with most of them, the truth is, is that there will be few that will enter in. They will not be the majority that we see around them. And that it makes it so terribly important for us to be able to share this message and to go out and to help our neighbors and to help our friends and help our family to come to the truth so that they will be one of the few that will be able to enter into that prepared place. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, section of it says, We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We are a part of the Lord's church here, those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that at the close of the age, that this church will be delivered to God to have an eternal home in heaven. And so we offer the invitation this morning. And as always, I address two groups. And let us start with those who are in the faith. Right now, whether we realize it or not, we are in the wilderness. We are wandering. We have passed through the waters of the Red Sea, and we look towards Canaan's land and know that it is through Jordan's waters that we will pass one day and not through the physical act of baptism but through the transition from the corruptible to the incorruptible but only if we had led our life with that obedience unto righteousness we have that blood put upon us because we have been baptized and because of that we can have our sins forgiven but have we lusted after the desires of this life and have we set up idols before us? And I'm not talking little golden statues. I'm talking about, is our work an idol? Is a person an idol? Is some type of activity, is a secret sin that we live in an idol that's going to keep us out of heaven? We need to purge that from our life. And the other group that I wish to address are those who are still standing in Egypt. Those who are still living under the bondage of sin and who are trapped by that taskmaster Satan, that you need to be free this morning and you can be free this morning. And just as the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea and were saved, you too can put on Christ in baptism. And the power of that is that you would go down into the water and you will raise up in a newness of life. As you were buried with Him, you raise up just like His resurrection and that cleansing blood of Jesus will be put upon you and your sins will be, will be forgiven. And you one day will have a chance to be at home in heaven with God. The invitation song that will be offered talks about the power of that blood. If you are outside of Christ, you don't have that powerful blood on you. But before you leave this morning, you can, if you will come and be baptized. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Whatever your need may be, please come as we stand and as we sing.